All right, so we are, again, we're looking at here Hebrews chapter 1, uh, and we're looking at these really five points that he's going to make very clear to us last week, having introduced us uh, to the cha- the, these uh, points that he wants to make, and looking at two of them in particular. So we're going to examine today three more of those. Uh, and the first uh, is, in, is very much significant in that it draws a distinction uh, between the creator and the created. And one of the things I, I really enjoy about this is the guy who likes to know how things work and what, what makes everything as it is, is though the focus of the Hebrew writer's intent here is, is that one would get the contrast to the significance of Jesus Christ over the angels, he also teaches us a great deal about Christ in that contrast. We learn a lot about who he is as I would believe is his appeal, is don't miss who it is that, that walked by. Where we, t- uh, for the Hebrews, and probably even ultimately for us, we can tend to focus on uh, some, some other aspects of our faith uh, and perhaps give them more significance than they should have, and sometimes in lieu or in place of, uh, of reverence that should be given to Christ alone. So let's, let's dive right into this, and let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. We're going to pick up in verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 1, and understanding that Jesus Christ is superior by nature. And there's a couple aspects to this. Uh, Number one is to understand this contrast or placing this uh, understanding in the mind of the the readers that Jesus Christ is the creator, and he's already dealt with that, but nonetheless reminding them of really the nature of the two. What is the difference between one who is the creator and one who is the created? In this case, between the angels and Uh, and the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, In verse 7, the the writer shows uh, the the basic difference, again, between, and he used a Greek word that we translate in English that makes, or which literally means, again, to create or to make. Uh, What are are we reading here? What is is he telling us? And when he says, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Uh, and those of you that have been around me long enough, you know that when uh, I always challenge you, when you read the Word of God, don't just read it to read it, but ask questions like a two-year-old. Uh, ask those fundamental questions, who, what, where, when, how, and why. What is, what's going on here? What is the, who's speaking here and to whom uh, is it being spoken to as much as to, to who are the agencies that are speaking through, uh, through the course of this? Because we have some pronouns here. And we have of the angels, he says, and he makes this statement. He makes his angels, who's he, wins, and his ministers a flame of fire. Uh, Those are good questions. And they are questions that the scriptures, uh, either in the direct context or other uh, aspects of scripture, often they'll they'll be answered very clearly for us. But if we don't ask those questions, I think sometimes we miss the significance of what it is that he's, uh, the writer, uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is trying to make uh, known to us. So pay close attention uh, to the pronouns here in this case. I want to take you first. Uh, over to Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, because I want you to be able to plug into this and understand who, the, who is he uh, that, that is being spoken of here, uh, and are the, the two he's that are being identified here different. So Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 10 through 16, it says this, He, now this comes from the context, we know that the he here is God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. So there it's very clear that we have a relationship. God the Father, God the Son, uh, and in the sending of that Son, he has transferred us uh, from the kingdom uh, of darkness to the kingdom of light. And who is the, the, the one that's bringing about this reality for us? It is the work of the Son. And he goes on, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So who is the one that provides for us redemption? Who is the one who gives us the forgiveness of sins? Again, connecting those pronouns. Okay, and then the point that I want to get to comes in really the, in verse 16, but 15 leading up to that, says he, God the Son, is the image of the invisible God. And we've learned that already through our study of Hebrews, to understand that in Christ we have seen God represented uh, in our presence. And he is the firstborn of all creation. And in verse 16, for by him, him being God the Son, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So now the pop quiz, who is the creator? Who is the creating agent that we are being uh, told uh, within Colossians so that we might know 
or recognize who the Creator is. It is God the Son, the person of Jesus Christ. And we know God the Father is the one who has brought this about. And, of course, when Christ was on earth, he made that very clear. I've not come to do my own will. I've come to do the will of the Father. And in carrying that out, he has provided for us redemption. And so Jesus Christ is the creator. In particular, looking back at our text, we see that Jesus Christ, then, is the creator of angels. And so as the creator of the angels, that would certainly make him the superior to the angels even as we would recognize as God's created handiwork, that he is our creator and therefore he is superior to us. So the creator is greater than the created. So let's go back then to this text. It says, of the angels, he says... Now, by the way, the Hebrew writer has been quoting what? Old Testament scripture. All right, and whose, whose word is it? God's word, right? And so he's quoting from that. So he's saying, God's word says, if I can kind of put this in the more of a practical vernacular, he, speaking of Christ, makes his, Christ angels, winds, and his, Christ ministers, a flame of fire. Jesus Christ is the creator. So not only were they created by him, but they are his possession. He speaks of them as his angels. So as we put this uh, back into that context, and of course we can even draw this out of the Hebrew context, but to kind of help it make it a little clearer, I go to that Colossians text. The angels are the created servants of God. They are his ministers, his winds, and flame of fire. So again, created, creator. Understanding there's a different nature to that. Uh, we are created creatures of God. We are finite creatures. We are we're not omniscient. We're not omnipresent. So we're and all those uh, aspects and attributes of God. There is a difference between us and God as creator. And we know that of the angels too. They can only be in one place uh, at a time. Uh, they are powerful, yes, but they are not all powerful. Uh, they know a lot, yes, but they don't know all things. Matter of fact, there's a great deal about us that they're still scratching their heads about, trying to get their minds around, understand the significance of this gospel thing that's being worked out uh, within humanity. And I think one of the things that they're looking at, this is God's holy angels, is saying, why is God tolerating them? Why is he showing them such grace? And God's point all along is, I'm a God of love. This is who I am. And this is what I am doing uh, in the midst. So certainly uh, we see this in his works. Uh, what is the handiwork of God? He is the creator. Uh, his nature as the, cre uh, the creator uh, is then he, he has uh, brought about the existence of these angels. Uh, and we see a difference in their works. He is the creator. They are the ministers to the creator. So they are created for that purpose. And we see that all through scripture. What do we see angels doing whenever we see them in scripture? They're either being sent on the behalf of God or they're doing battle on the, on the purpose of serving God or bringing news that the Lord has sent them to, to bring. And so, again, all of it so that we might, again, see that God is creator and they are the created. Now, when we look at this next aspect that he gives to us, so the first part of verse 8 uh, expands really on the difference between Christ's nature and that of the angels. And here is, again, really an amazing statement uh, within Scripture, and that is that Jesus is God eternal. Again, when you think about their nature, angels were created. They had a beginning. God didn't. Christ did not. And so this is, again, a very clear statement to understand the difference. He says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A, an important distinction versus what he says of the angels. Uh, those who say Jesus was just a man, or just one of many angels, or one of many prophets of God, or, or, or that he's somehow some sort of sub-God, uh, they're, they're, again, they're, they're lying and bringing upon themselves, again, the curse of God. They're preaching some other gospel. Uh, we understand from the very clear teaching of Scripture that Jesus is God, God eternal, uh, and so he is, as uh, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are, are eternal in, in existence. Uh, and we know that uh, on that opening day, if you will, of, of history, uh, the Trinity was there. All, all members of the Trinity, if they were created for us, uh, we know with certainty that they are eternal, uh, eternal in nature. So the Father says to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God the Father acknowledges God the Son. And I believe this verse gives, again, the very clear and powerful and emphatic and irrefutable proof of the deity of Christ uh, within Scripture. We get that from the words of God the Father himself. Uh, much like when Christ was here on earth at his baptism. You see all three members of the Trinity actively at work in that moment. 
uh, as Jesus Christ, God the Son, is being baptized and coming out of the water. You see the dove descending uh, from heaven, the, the Spirit of God descending upon him. And then you hear the very words of God the Father himself saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, so we see them as distinctive. And again, understanding that they are God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are God and they are eternal. And there is a distinction in their nature between them as the creative agency and us as the created. And in particular, the angels as those that are created. Now, Jesus Christ, when he was here on this earth, uh, that was, a matter of fact, one of the, the testimonies that he would, uh, 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 they would seek to stone him for. And that is his identification uh, with God. Uh, we see this in John chapter 5 and verse 18. It says, For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, there's one violation to get stoned for, uh, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And, of course, if you don't believe that he's God, uh, that would be blasphemy uh, in your mind. And so they're preparing to stone him. But uh, uh, Jesus himself said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. We are one and the same. And so they are eternal beings. Now for a Hebrew, again, this is, this is, uh, this is a key understanding because they don't think Trinitarian as, you know, as we have in our Christian understanding and, and knowledge. They tend to think God with very, very much a distinction of monotheistic, one God, one person, uh, whereas we understand uh, quite differently. Not that they didn't see it in the Old Testament, but that is how they understood it. And so the Hebrew writer again wants them to understand that this Jesus, the Christ, is God eternal. And he is not uh, some other uh, angelic uh, representation. So in the light of who they thought he was, a mere man, this is for those religious leaders, their reaction again was to be expected. As you go on in verse 33 in John 5, they says, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Uh, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God, and what irony, when he was God, they failed to see the truth. Uh, even as it was stepping uh, before them. Uh, and the Hebrew writer would say, let's not miss the truth uh, that stood before us. So again, superiority by, by nature, uh, both through his, his works, uh, by virtue of his deity, uh, he is God. Uh, you know, so we have his creative work, uh, his identification as the second person of the Trinity, as being God. Uh, but then also uh, God, the Father, speaking of him, uh, as is quoted out of the Old Testament psalm, and we continue to read, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then the second attribute, this, the scepter of uh, uprightness, is the scepter of your kingdom. Uh, Jesus Christ has an eternal throne from which he rules eternity as God and King. And we know that he is at the right hand of the Father even now. Uh, he is the eternal King and an eternal kingdom, uh, an eternal scepter of righteousness. But he goes on, he says, You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Again, his, his fellow uh, workers uh, within this realm. So the verse reveals both Jesus' actions uh, and his motives. Uh, he not only acted in righteousness, he loved righteousness. Now, how often do we take this into the practical? How often do we know, God, uh, know that it is God's will and we do it without joy, and we do it really with uh, some sort of unwilling condensation, kind of like, you know, the, as a child, your parents going and telling you to apologize to your, your sibling, right? Well, I'm going to go do it out of compliance, but not out of a surrender of will, but out of purpose of will. But for Christ, his love of righteousness, he did what was right because that is what he was and what he loved. And so he loved righteousness. Uh, so I'll kind of expand on this. Look at what uh, James says. This comes out of James chapter 1 uh, and verse 17. He says, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, lights, which, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Now there's a lot in this, but one of those attributes is to understand that the, the, the perfect righteousness of God uh, is given to us uh, through the agency of God to us. Uh, this is true righteousness, every good thing. It never varies from what is true, just and good. And so ours is a good God, and he gives that and shares that goodness with us. But not only is he a good God, but he is constant in that goodness. And so as we reflect upon our God to us, you know, we have a confidence of knowing. We look at our own experience with our Lord and we say, you know what? our God has been good to us. But you know, we have a full confidence that tomorrow he's going to be just as good. Now, he may not always show himself in goodness as we saw him show himself today. It may be expressed in another way. 
but we always know tomorrow, the next day, weeks to come, months to come, God will always be good. There's no change in that, no shifting in that. Uh, so there is no variation uh, in his goodness. Uh, the Apostle John would add to this, and he says, In this message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, we can never give or, 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 or attribute uh, evil to, to the work of God. Uh, God never varies. Uh, his motives, his actions, his character, uh, they never vary, vary. He is total light to us. He is total righteousness. And displayed in everything Jesus did was his love for righteousness. And we said that was his great passion. And much like the psalmist would say in Psalm 119 in verse 97, and those of you who have been studying through Psalm 119 uh, with me, you understand that this is the great message of this psalm, uh, and that is for one to truly love the law of God. And for Christ, that was the truth for him. He says, how, oh, how I love thy law, uh, and it is my meditation all the day. And so Jesus would certainly agree uh, with uh, the psalmist uh, in, in that. Well, so he is uh, certainly superior by nature. He is superior by virtue of his right, righteousness. Uh, because Christ loves righteousness, he hates uh, wickedness, as we look back in our text here. Uh, if you love God's right standards, uh, and if you have God's heart, you will hate wrong standards. You will hate those things inconsistent with his nature. And these two convictions, they're inseparable. One cannot exist without the other. And we try to play this game sometimes. You cannot truthfully say, I love righteousness, but I also like sin. Uh, that, that doesn't work. Uh, that is to love evil. When there is a true love for God, there will be a total love for righteousness and a total hatred of sin. Uh, just as uh, Jesus hated sin, uh, as, as surely as he loved righteousness, uh, we, we see that worked out in his temptation. Uh, we see that worked out uh, in his uh, cleansing of the temple. Uh, we see that in his going to the cross. Why did he go to the cross? But that the wrath must be, must be satisfied uh, the judgment must uh, be, be born. And so the more that we become conformed to our Lord, uh, the more that we are going to find that we too love righteousness and hate sin. And that should be a growing attribute of our own character day by day as we grow in Christ. Uh, we should begin to show the character of Christ in us. So by our attitudes towards righteousness and towards sin, we can tell how close we are really to being conformed uh, to Christ. So it becomes, you know, how comfortable am I when I sin? How comfortable am I being in the presence uh, in the conduct of sin? Uh, and it uh, shows us really uh, the intensity of our relationship with the Lord. Well, in Hebrews 1.9, again, a very direct statement uh, concerning Jesus' superiority to angels. He says, therefore, God... Uh, your God, God the Father, has anointed you, Jesus Christ, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And so beyond those fellow agents that Jesus has been given a special position, a special place. Uh, the point being made here again is that Jesus Christ is greater than the angels uh, who are his associates, certainly in ministry. Uh, they are certainly his heavenly companions. That's sort of what they were created for. But they are, they are angels and are only uh, the, the agents and the messengers of God. And so Christ, too, though he is a messenger of God, he is much more than a messenger, and therefore much more uh, than the angels uh, in uh, nature. And so he is exalted. He is anointed above all the others. And therefore Jesus' nature, uh, that is his deity, like his title, and like being worshipped as we looked at before, they show his superiority uh, to the angels. Well, what about uh, superior existence? Uh, looking at verses 10 through 12. Uh, the fourth way in which Jesus is superior uh, to the angels is in his existence. Uh, in this quotation from Psalm 102, the Holy Spirit reveals that Christ is better than angels because, again, we already talked about this uh, to some point, uh, he exists eternally. If Jesus was in the beginning uh, to create, he must have existed before the beginning and therefore uh, must be without beginning. Uh, and as John 1, 1 declares, in the beginning was the Word. And so even at the point of the opening chapter of Genesis, uh, Jesus Christ already existed. And so he is the creator. Uh, he is also, by the way, folks, as this goes on to tell us, he is going to be the re-creator. Uh, he says, uh, and he uses this analogy, just as we would roll up and throw away an old worn-out garment, uh, when we are done with it, Jesus one day will discard the heavens and the earth. And so his uh, creative uh, work is ongoing, and one day there's going to be this great recreation, if you will, of the world in which we live. Let's look at Second Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, Peter, speaking of this coming day, and he says the day of the Lord uh, will come like a thief, and then what's going to happen? 
uh, at this unexpected arrival of this day, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And so there's this day, the earth itself will be transformed. Uh, and it's interesting that this is something that all the senses would experience. So there's an audio uh, sound or roar to it, as much as there's going to be uh, the ability to see and observe. Now, we know that we're not going to be in the midst of that. Uh, we'll be with our Savior. But nonetheless, there is a day coming when recreation will be a part of his work, his redemptive work, when he'll make a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, Revelation shows this. Uh, Re Re this is Revelation chapter 6 uh, in ver uh, verse 14. It says, the sky vanished like a scroll. John is observing this uh, like a scroll that is being rolled up. What an image of, of heaven, right? Uh, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And so again, this recreative work that's going on. During the tribulation, as if the heavens were to be stretched to the limit uh, and the corners then cut, they will roll up just like a scroll. Uh, the stars are going to fall, come crashing down to earth, and every island and mountain will move out of its place. The whole world will become undone. And the things that we can see and feel, you know, we look at them and they seem so permanent. And yet to this world, it will not be as it is now. And so like the people that Peter warned, we must not think, this comes out of 2 Peter 3, 4, that all continues uh, just as it has from the beginning of creation, but to recognize that our creator is going to be the recreator uh, and bring about this, this transformation, as, we saw, uh, as he tells us in 2 Peter 3, 4. So all these things are going to perish, and the Lord is going to create a, a new heaven uh, and a new earth. And one day we'll be able to see that uh, for ourselves. And so, he, again, a, a, appealing to his existence. Uh, the creation will ch be changed, uh, but not the creator. And that's the comparison here uh, in this great work. He says, your years, God speaking to God the, God the Son, your years will have no end. Uh, Christ is eternal. He is immutable. He never changes. Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. Uh, he will tell us in Hebrews 13.8. Uh, uh, so in our relationships, uh, uh, human beings will come and go, uh, worlds will come and go, uh, stars will come and go, angels uh, certainly were subject to decay as we see some have rebelled, but Christ never changes, he's never subject to change, and he is never subject to alteration. Uh, he is eternally the same, and as the creator, uh, even though the creation will uh, certainly undergo massive transformation, our creator will never change. And so he therefore is superior in angels in title, in worship, in nature, in existence, and then finally in destiny. What is the future uh, for Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? So here within only the first chapter, uh, we're giving uh, the seventh Old Testament quotation from Psalm 110, uh, verse 1. Again, what is the Hebrew writer doing? He's appealing to the Hebrews with the witness of their own Old Testament, we would call it, text that they would know and understand that Jesus is indeed who he is. And so it climaxes the teaching of the full superiority of Christ to angels. First we see the destiny of Christ, and then that of the angels. No angel has ever been promised a place at God's right hand. Only the Son sits there. Uh, we see this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, it is at the name of Jesus that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It is he that will be given this prominence. And so the destiny of Jesus Christ is that ultimately everything in the universe uh, will be subject to him. And Jesus Christ, is, in God's uh, eternal plan, is destined to be the ruler of the universe and everything that inhabits uh, it. And by the way, we've looked at this before, but it's, it's certainly, when you look at the big picture, the culmination of history, I gave you this uh, text out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 24 and 25, and then verse 28. Paul really outlining history for the Corinthians to understand what's yet to come. And he says, then comes the end, when he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he, Jesus Christ, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then 28, really the culmination, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And as at that point, really, history is culminated and completed. As God the Son says, I have redeemed everything that I have been sent to redeem. All things have been made new. And then he himself will take his proper place within that Trinitarian relationship as God the Son. 
And therefore, history itself will be complete. The destiny of Jesus Christ, what is ultimately to be brought about. And so under his feet are placed all the kingdoms and authorities and the powers of the world. Uh, when does this take place? Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 15 and 16. Uh, from his mouth, and again this is Christ, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is who we, how we know uh, Jesus Christ. And what do, when does this happen? It happens at his second coming, uh, when he comes in glory. And of course it's culminated at the end of that great millennial reign, when finally uh, death itself is going to be uh, put in, uh, in, in eternal separation from God. Uh, and uh, he'll make all things new. So the destiny, it is, is really his final point. So notice the destiny of God's angels as he makes this last point. His understanding Christ's destiny is the future king of kings and lord of lords, of bringing all of history uh, to conclusion. He says, compare that to the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits set out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And so what a contrast. One and so, so dramatic, so significant. Uh, the other is definitely significant, but definitely different in purpose uh, in what they're to accomplish. Uh, Jesus' destiny is to reign. Uh, the angel's destiny is to serve uh, those who are heir of, the heirs of salvation. And now for us, that is a, an amazing prospect to know that they're ministering even on our behalf. Uh, and, and they'll continue to do that. But Jesus' destiny, uh, in contrast, is to, again to reign. And so he is immeasurably superior uh, to that of the angels. In some respects, again, we read this in our, our Christian history and our Christian background. We say, well, of course, we know Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. So why, why do we want to study this text? Why would we go through this again? And I, I don't think it should be lost upon us, the warning that the Hebrew writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving to his Hebrew audience. Because we can find ourselves enamored with the creation, forgetting the creator. And you look at our own human history, even our own lifetimes, and it's been very common for within the church these waves of things to flow through. We become impressed with them. We become excited about them. And somehow it diminishes the, the priority and the importance of who Jesus Christ is. And for the Hebrew writer, he's taken something that to a Hebrew understanding is very sacred. And that is the angels who are ministering agents to them of the law and saying, I want you to understand truly who is the significant? Who is the superior? Are angels significant? Are they important? Absolutely. But understand that there is one far greater, and that is the one who came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I give you this, really, as we, as we wrap this up. Uh, this is right out of our, our text for next time. When you think about, uh, this comes out of Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 1 and 3, kind of an introduction for our next study. It says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Why must we study this text? Why must we be reminded of these things? Because we have this innate tendency in our humanity to drift. Some of you are probably doing it right now, <laughs> right? We drift. We lose focus. We fail to understand what is going on. Yes, but he's droned on. And no, but don't drift. Don't lose sight of it. He says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. In other words, he's going to the Hebrew writers and saying, this message that you've received through these angelic witnesses, it is proven to be reliable. Uh, and every transgression, uh, the message of judgment uh, or disobedience received, it has received a just retribution. How shall we escape? In other words, look at the truthfulness of even what you, ver you believe through the witness of God, through these angelic beings. If this has come true, if this is a reality, how much more I've just given you the very words of God concerning the person of Christ. Don't drift from the truth. Hold fast because if God has brought these things about, if judgment has truly come about through this God, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If we don't celebrate and, uh, and fall in love with Jesus Christ, what cost does it come to us as? What price do we pay? in the failure to understand that. And so we, we go back to the text and we study it again and we remind ourselves again because by and large, well, all of us are sinners by, by birth, 
Uh, and the flesh loves that, uh, and uh, we're naturally deceived. We're always distracted. We have this tendency to drift. Let us not lose sight of who Jesus Christ is, because the consequence is too severe. And he goes on to say, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who were heard. In other words, this is faithful and true. This witness is true. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we find that the Son of God is superior to the angels in what way? Every way. Uh, each of his superiorities have been described as he quotes from the Old Testament. God the Father testifying concerning God the Son. We learn that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. What is a Messiah? The long-awaited one, the one who will deliver, the one who will save. He has come in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have learned that he is God in flesh. To see Christ is to see God. And he has made that clear through his own words. And we've also discovered that he is the mediator of a new covenant. Our message is from Christ himself. He is the good news. It is a covenant better than the old. Matter of fact, it is the old covenant that pointed to the new, that gave us our need uh, for a savior. And so in this brief 14 verse chapter, we see the deity of Jesus Christ established by these divine names that have been given to him. He is called the Son. He is called the Lord. He is called God. By his divine works, he creates, he sustains, he governs, he redeems, and he purges sin. By divine worth, he is the one to be worshipped by the angels and all other creatures in the universe. By divine attributes, he is omniscient, omnipotent, unchanging, and eternal. In all these ways, the superiority of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. And so back to that text, don't drift from what we know to be true. Because the world is there at work, self is there at work, Satan is there at work. Don't think in any way that anything is superior to Jesus Christ. It is through his death, burial, and resurrection that there is salvation, and it is through that death, burial, and resurrection that we are sustained, and it is that death, burial, and resurrection that will one day present us glorified before God the Father. Nothing else will do. We must not miss this. We must not escape this. We must not let it drift away. Again, why are they so true? Why is it so important? Because to, to, to drift from it is to then fall into the, the prey of the evil one and find ourselves losing sight of the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. So if God expected such a response uh, to the law, to the word, which came through the angels, uh, what response does he expect concerning what we know today from the gospel that is made known to us, which came to us through the person of Jesus Christ? Well, I give you this in closing, and this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It comes out of the latter part of verse 2. He says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the moment. This is the favorable time because of what has been made, to, made known to us through the person of, of Jesus Christ. And so as then, that even now as we hear these truths, uh, that we would receive and, and believe in what Christ has made known to us, what he has accomplished, and then remain steadfast in that belief. Steadfast as we serve uh, here upon this earth. And so we have much in common with the Hebrews. We're still these same human beings who have this tremendous tendency to depart from that which we know is true. And it serves to us as a warning, as much as an exhortation, as it does to a confidence builder in our God to know that Jesus Christ is the superior witness and testimony of God to us. And for that, we have thanks. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, for the, oh, the reminder. And Lord, and on one sense, we can say, oh, I know that. But on another sense, Lord, we find ourselves guilty of that tendency to drift. Father, revive us, remind us, call us, Lord, to that precious significance of who came in the person of Jesus Christ. May we never lose sight of who he is. May we live day by day in our Christian faith and the confidence that, that we need no, no one else, we need nothing else. Everything has been given to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And may we live in the celebrated confidence that tomorrow we will see him face to face. And Father, as always, it is our prayer. And Lord, we know it is your heart's desire that if there is one here who doesn't know Christ, that they would realize that now is the favorable time, 
Now is the appointed time. Now is the time for salvation. That today they, in trusting belief, will turn to Jesus Christ as their Redeemer. And they'll put their faith and trust in Him and Him alone for salvation. Oh, Father, we pray that even now your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to the, their need of a Savior and they would believe. And so, Father, we pray all of these things knowing what an amazing God it is that we serve, rejoicing in the confidence you've given us through the knowledge of your word. And we thank you, Lord, for what you have done and are doing for us. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.